Welcome everybody. I am excited to um, have you all here and welcome you to Asteroids for Everyone, talking about how amateurs and professionals hunt for asteroids. And uh, we're excited. I'm going to turn it right over to Jessica Swan, who's here from Infiniscope. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Hi, thank you so much for hosting this for us. We sincerely appreciate it. And I want to welcome all of you and also send out a huge thank you to Gerald and Rachel for joining us today. Um, so we've sent this as a shout out to our entire network over here at Infiniscope. Um, and so if you're not a member of Infiniscope, just real quickly, what we do is we design digital learning experiences. And one of the reasons that we were really interested in uh, having this webinar for our network and for the Night Sky Network is that uh, Asteroid Week is coming up, or I'm sorry, Astronomy Week is coming up. And that actually starts on September 29th. And we here at Infiniscope have a um, surprise announcement to make at the conclusion of this webinar, a cool new resource to share with you that is completely related to asteroid it's Asteroid Hunting and Astronomy Week. So we thought, what better way to launch this new learning experience than to bring in some of the friends from the Night Sky Network to talk with you all a little bit about how we find these asteroids. Um, and so uh, let me do a quick introduction and introduce you all to Gerald and to Rachel. So Gerald is an astronomer. Uh, he's a telescope operator and a planetarium show producer. Um, he's at the Chabot Space and Science Center in Oakland, California. He has a master's degree in, um, um, I'm sorry, a master of science degree in space studies and over 40 years of experience in working in the space industry. And since 2008, Gerald has been the principal investigator, we call that the PI, uh, for Chabot's asteroid search and tracking program. Uh, he's also appeared in numerous television and other media interviews. Isn't that fantastic? And uh, so he's, uh, you know, been answering questions about significant astronomy events. And then also on the line, we have Rachel Freed, and she is the co-founder and president of the Institute for Student Astronomical Research, also known as NSTAR, as well as a seminar instructor with a mission to incorporate true scientific research into secondary and undergraduate education. Uh, she helps to coordinate international conferences all around, uh, all around the use of telescopes and education. And she currently is working on her PhD in astronomy education. Yay! Uh, she has a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from UC Davis and a uh, Master's of Science in neuro Neuroscience from Northwestern University. So a huge welcome to you both. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, Please, if you have any questions, as Vivian has mentioned, you know, go ahead and toss your questions over into Q&A, or you can toss them over into chat. We would love to know what your questions are. We know that uh, Gerald and Rachel are going to answer many of our questions up front as they talk a little bit about their work when it comes to asteroid hunting. And when they're done with their presentations, we'll actually uh, combine all of your questions into groupings and just kind of do a free-for-all Q&A. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Gerald, and let you kind of share your experiences with the group. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, what I want to do is uh, start up a little PowerPoint here. So bear with me just a second while I get that set up here. Uh, hopefully you'll see that in a second here. Everybody see that? I see thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so let me see if I can get it started now. Here we go. Okay, so um, again, I'm an astronomer at the Chabot Space and Science Center, and I'm the principal investigator on Chabot's uh, Near Earth Asteroid Tracking Program. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about, first of all, some basic terminology and concepts. Uh, you'll hear a lot the, the term NEO or NEO, which stands for Near Earth Object. This can be an asteroid or an old comet orbiting the sun. It's mostly asteroids. Uh, and they orbit around the sun and they come within 28 million miles of the Earth's orbit. Now, the reason for 28 million miles is because that's how close Venus gets to the Earth when the two are closest to each other. So we consider any object that gets closer to the Earth than Venus does to be a near-Earth object. <clears throat> now, there's a subset of that. It's actually the biggest subset 
and that's the near, near Earth asteroids or NEAs. Um, these asteroids all orbit around the sun and some of them come reasonably close to the Earth. Uh, I'd say about a dozen come closer to the moon or closer than the moon about uh, several times a year. Uh, in fact, so far this year, we've had a little over 40 asteroids come closer to us than the moon. But impacts are actually very rare. Uh, most of these asteroids just pass safely by us and they're, they're not a concern. Uh, there is a global effort to find near-Earth objects. Uh, so far, as of 10 o'clock last night, we have found 20,816 near-Earth objects. Out of those, about 2,000 are considered potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, a PHA is an asteroid that is larger than 140 meters and comes within less than 0 0.05 astronomical units of the Earth. The astronomical unit is the uh, distance, average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So if an asteroid comes closer than 5% uh, of that, then it's considered a PHA if it's larger than 140 meters. Um, in terms of the total population of near-Earth objects, we think that there are probably more than a million of them out there, but so far we've only found a little over 20,000. So there's still a lot of them out there to be found. So I'll talk a little bit about how they're found. Most asteroids are not found by amateur astronomers. They're found by um, survey telescopes, professional survey telescopes. There are several of them around the world. Uh, three of them are in uh, Arizona up on Mount Lemmon. There's a couple of them in, in Hawaii, the Pan Stars. Uh, used to be Pan Stars 1, now there's Pan Stars 2, so we now have two of them. Um, a new one coming online in a couple of years is the uh, LSST down in Chile. With, and all of these telescopes, what they do is scan the sky every night just looking for transient objects, objects that might be uh, new, newly discovered asteroids. Now they're constantly surveying, so they don't have a lot of time to go back and zero in on any one asteroid. They, they spot them uh, as they scan. And if they do, they submit their data to the uh, International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center. And from there, uh, the Minor Planet Center puts out a request that goes out to uh, a whole slew of observatories around the world. There's about 300 active observatories working on this program. <clears throat> and they do uh, additional observations, try to confirm the existence of any new asteroids, and they also do tracking of, of known asteroids and so forth. And we all submit our data to the International Astronomical Union, Union's uh, Minor Planet Center, which is in Massachusetts. And this is the global clearinghouse for all asteroid data. Uh, Minor Planet Center analyzes the data, does computations trying to determine the orbit and size, and it shares that data with uh, the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. So what we do in, at Chabot, our telescope is not well suited for doing uh, surveys. So what we do is called confirmation and follow-up. Confirmation is where we chase down some of those possible new discoveries made by the survey telescopes. Uh, we try to locate them sometime after the initial discovery and confirm that they're there, track them and get data to help uh, characterize the uh, orbit of the asteroid and maybe its size. In addition, once an asteroid has been confirmed and it goes on to a master catalog of known asteroids, you need to continue uh, observing it uh, to improve the uh, calculation of the orbit and to improve the, the size estimates. So that's what we do. We do confirmation, trying to confirm new discoveries, and follow up, trying to get additional data on known asteroids. So talking just a little bit about how we do that, uh, we're looking for two types of data. One is called astrometry, and that is basically position data. Um, the astronomy community uses a, a coordinate system that's similar to the GPS coordinate system. Uh, uses right ascension, which is the east-west position, and declination, which is north-south position. 
and uh, we report those positions uh, to the IA or to the Minor Planet Center. Uh, we have to use a very exact time system because timing is very critical on these uh, asteroid observations. So we uh, have a method of, of making sure our computers are real precisely synchronized to uh, universal time. The other information is photometry. That's basically how bright is the object in our images. And that information is used to calculate a, a size estimate for the asteroids. So the way we do it is we just point the telescope at a given part of the sky where we think there might be an asteroid. We take three or four sets of images. So this is just four examples right here. And some of you are probably looking and saying, well, I think that's the asteroid or maybe that one's the asteroid. Um, but we have a much better way of doing that. Now, one of the things you'll notice about these images is they're not nice, clean, um, pretty looking uh, images of the, the night sky. They're kind of dirty. And there's a reason for that. When we're looking for asteroids, asteroids can be very faint. So we need to be able to see very faint objects in our images. So we uh, use a technique called stretching, where we make the image kind of look kind of blotchy and the background is not black, it's kind of a mottled gray. But by doing that, we can bring out those very, very faint objects. So anyway, we take several pictures like this, and then we have to use a process to kind of get them ready for uh, tracking the asteroid. And to do that, we have to precisely locate each of the images. So there's a group of stars in the images. We compare those stars to a master catalog of known stars. <clears throat> and there are several different catalogs that we can use. And we're using software to do this. And, and we try to identify all the stars in the image, get their exact uh, position in terms of right ascension and declination and then use that to create a formula that equates the pixel position in the images to the right, in, right ascension and declination coordinates uh, that we use for astronomy. Once we've done that with all the images, it's just a matter of blinking through the images to see if we can find the asteroid. So what we're looking for is a star that moves. Uh, the word asteroid means star-like. And as you can see there, it looks like a star, except that it's moving. And if you can't find it visually, you can always look for the blue arrow in the sky. That'll help you find it. <laughs> okay, so uh, once we've uh, located it in, in the images, we go back to the each individual frame and we spot the uh, asteroid in each frame. And then we do some additional processing. And again, we're using specialized software to, to do this. Uh, there's several different software packages out there. The one that's probably used most commonly is called Astrometrica. And with the software, you just click on one of the asteroid images and it gives you a bunch of data. Now, the, a lot of the data that you see here is just quality data, letting us confirm that uh, we do, in fact, are looking at an asteroid or, or a real object. Uh, images are often contaminated with hot pixels or cosmic ray strikes and things like that. But by using this quality data, we can identify what's real and what's not. Um, once we do that, we get a set of data. You see some data that's uh, in the red box there. That's the critical data. That's the exact time of the image down to a fraction of a second. And the right ascension and declination of the asteroid in that image and also a estimate of its brightness. Once we do that for all four images, we then put it together and into a specially formatted email. Uh, the Minor Planet Center has a prescribed format for these emails. They have to be text only and um, everything has to be formatted exactly, the, the spacing and so forth. These emails are sent to the Minor Planet Center but you're not sending it to a person, you're sending it to a computer. The computer automatically processes it, sends you a response telling you whether it's been accepted or whether there's problems with your data. <clears throat> and then they combine this with uh, observations from other observatories to develop the initial orbital elements. And eventually after two or three nights, they assign it a permanent designation. 
excuse me. So after we find an asteroid and after we've, uh, it's been assigned a permanent designation, we're not finished. We have to do some additional observations, uh, what's called follow-up observations. And there are some limitations. We can only do that at night, which means we can only track the asteroid when it's uh, in a position we call at opposition, which means it's on the night side of the Earth. Um, that means the discovery window and the observation window can be very short. Initial observations uh, during the first few days, the orbit calculation can be pretty uncertain. So you need more observations in order to better characterize the orbits. Um, the longer you wait for those follow-up observations, the greater the uncertainty is about what the orbit uh, for the asteroid is. In fact, most asteroids, especially the PHAs, are, are eventually lost because there isn't enough follow-up observations. So we really need to have a lot more follow-up done. For potential impactors, this is especially critical because we want to determine what the probability is of a future impact. And as you uh, initially do a set of observations, your, your uncertainty window is very large. And if the Earth is within that in, uh, window, then you, um, you have some probability of an impact. As you get more observations, that window shrinks. But if it's still contains the Earth, then the probability of impact actually appears to go up. But as you continue to make more and more observations, eventually you reduce the probability window to the point where the Earth is no longer in it, we hope. And um, then uh, you can no longer consider that asteroid a threat. So that's the basic process that we use. Uh, couple of pieces of information I wanted to share with you. These are some websites that relate to asteroid tracking. Of course, the Minor Planet Center, they're the ones who collect all the data. They post the, the list of objects that need observation. Uh, they determine the initial orbits and so forth. The software that I use is Astrometrica. It's developed by an astronomer in Austria and it's very popular. It's used uh, all over the world. Uh, if you want to learn a lot of how to, good how-to information, you can go to the uh, Great Shefford uh, Observatory. Uh, this is run by a private amateur astronomer in England, and he has some very good information and tips about how to do asteroid observation. And then if you just want to see some good data, you go to the uh, Jet Propulsion Labs Center for Near-Earth Object Studies. And they have tables of upcoming close approaches and lots of other good information. So that's about it. Awesome, thank you so much, Gerald. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Um, something that um, piqued my interest so it got my little educator juices kind of flowing. Can you go back to the, to the screen where you actually have the GIF of the, um, of the asteroid tracking? Sure. Sure, hang on just a second here. Sure. Uh, let's see, which one was that? This one? You'll have to hit the share button. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, let's see. This one. Uh, yes, but I think the one before where it actually shows the, the animation. Okay, hang on a second here. Sure thing. This one. Yes, this one. All right, okay. so related to your, your comment about if you wait too long, to make your next observation. I think there's actually, uh, there's possibly a graphing activity that teachers could engage in with their students in the classroom that's related to that. Could you speak just a little bit more about, you know, if we waited to make the next observations, what kind of observations could you potentially run into? 
Well, if you look at this track, you, you, look, you can see the movement of the asteroid. And just by visually looking at it, you can see where the asteroid's going to be, say, half an hour later. Mm -hmm. But if you were to draw a line through the three points that you see here and extend that line outward, say, several days, um, that line is no longer a line. It becomes a, a cone, if you will. And so our ability to know where the asteroid is going to be uh, farther away uh, decreases. And so uh, you can reach a point where uh, the, the uncertainty around the asteroid's position actually exceeds a, uh, a one uh, minute of arc, or, or I'm sorry, one degree of arc. And most people don't have the ability to see the sky in, in one image, a, a total of one degree. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you think, think you know where it is, but it turns out it's off by a half degree or one degree. Mm -hmm. And so you can't find it anymore. And so right. you lose it. So, so is it, um, so a lot of times we probably are, as observers, we're confusing this thinking that it's kind of, when we observe it, it appears to be kind of just in two dimensional space, but that's actually three three-dimensional, it could be moving away or closer to us and affecting that the way we're tracking. Correct. Correct. And also because you can only do this at night, you only have a limited time in which you can observe the asteroid. Uh, because as the asteroid orbits around the Earth, eventually it's going to get in a position where it's no longer in our night sky. And then it, it could be two or three years before it reappears in the sky. And if you've waited two or three years and you had a lot of uncertainty from your original set of observations, you may not find it at all. Right. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for describing that. I just wanted to make sure that the teachers on the line, I wanted to be able to connect those dots for you that if you wanted to be able, if you're looking for a good graphing exercise or prediction ex exercise, this might be a way to be able to pull in some really cool relevant content uh, for students in, in those in the math capacity. So just Thank you so much for, for answering that question. We do have a couple of questions that are in the chat, but I think we're gonna wait until after Rachel and then we'll combine all of our questions together and you both can respond to the questions that, that the group have. Sounds good. Awesome, thanks so much, Gerald. All right, Rachel, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, wow, that was really interesting and an exciting talk. And my brain is now very excited about like, I want to sit down with you and go through this whole process of tracking asteroids and, and um, you know, integrate this into the, what I do. So let me tell you guys a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Can everyone see the screen that says robotic telescopes in education? Yeah. Okay. So what I do um, is I try and get students anywhere from eighth grade up through undergraduates involved in astronomy research because it's possible now with the telescopes and remote access and all the technology we have. And it's such an amazing way to learn science, to learn how to, um, how science is done to actually do real science, participate in data collection and analyze data, and to learn how to communicate, how to present your research, how to write for publication. And that's a really big component of what I do. So um, these are students that I worked with uh, in June of this year up at Mount Wilson Observatory collecting data on, uh, we actually used the 100-inch historic telescope there and collected data, and they're finishing writing papers from that. So um, Let's see here, if I can go to the next slide. So I co-founded the Institute for Student Astronomical Research. And so if we have educators on the line here, um, I'll tell you, I started this because I was in a high school astronomy teacher and I wanted my students to do, to have the opportunity to do research, but um, didn't have the tools and the background necessary to do it. And I, it was very frustrating and I couldn't find the resources. So I've, over the last four to five years, been building those resources. And so now I teach people around the, the country and around the world how to get students involved in astronomy research. Um, so we have this nonprofit organization now. We had National Science Foundation funding and we're um, really expanding and it's exciting. So we have developed um, the Small Telescope Astronomical Research Handbook, which is sort of our textbook. Um, and it's, you know, how not only how to do astronomy research and the science, but how to write a paper for publication, how to work in teams, sort of all these things that 
go into doing research that maybe aren't part of a normal science course, actually usually aren't. Um, and we have a whole online learning management system set up that can actually just be copied and made your own if you're interested in Canvas. Um, and we teach classes on this. So uh, I also make video tutorials, lots of these. We use Astro Image J, it's another image processing software to do our astrometric measurements. Gerald measured, uh, mentioned ast astrometry, which is the measurement of positions of things. And that's what we do mostly. Um, we're looking at double stars and looking at you know, their historical observations so we can you know, contribute to the orbits that have been calculated from observations from the past 150 years. Um, we also do exoplanet transits and um, uh, variable stars. And we're going to get be getting into asteroid, you know, looking, finding, following up on those asteroid measurements, because that's so important. Um, so we have all kinds of resources. And one of the other things I do is I help coordinate and put on international conferences around robotic telescopes. And one of the coolest things that has come out of that is um, the Las Cumbres Observatory is a network of, they have, I think, 24 telescopes around the globe um, in all northern and southern hemispheres. And the ones shown here, the little green dots, these are, they have 10 0.4 meter telescopes um, that after our first robotic telescope conference in 2017, um, they made accessible for education. So there are 22 partners around the globe that have access to these telescopes and it is amazing. And this would be really great for doing um, asteroid follow-up because you can follow these things for longer. You can follow them 24 hours a day since we have telescopes all around the globe. So that would be really fun to implement. So um, we use telescopes there. The Skynet Robotic Telescope Network, we use these telescopes. We have access to all kinds of telescopes, which is so much fun. This is exactly what I wanted for my students. And now I get to help other people um, access these and use these. And um, we also, there's also um, a micro observatory. If you work with younger students, this is a really great place to start. What's really cool now, though, is a lot of click, um, organizations like Micro Observatory and Skynet, they're developing these uh, browser-based image analysis tools. Um, and Astrometrica, I've, I've opened it, I haven't used it for measurements, but I don't know if it runs equally well on any kind of computer or not, or if it, I think you download it, but um, sometimes that's difficult in a classroom setting. So uh, there's these browser-based tools where you can do exoplanet photometry, so measuring the change in brightness as an exoplanet goes in front of its star and um, process all your images. So we, um, there's also my... Uh, micro observatory that people can access. And by the way, all these things are close to free. Well, these three I've mentioned, if you become a global sky partner with Las Cumbres Observatory through a proposal process, then you can get free access to these telescopes and a micro observatory free, free programs where you can use these little telescopes to introduce students to research and, and um, photometry and the tools, the real tools of astronomers. Um, I mentioned uh, writing for publication is a really important part of our work. And this is one example. This is the Journal of Double Star Observations um, from April of this year. And I had to break up the page, but you can see here all the ones with stars on them are papers published by students um, at different branches of the astronomy research seminar that I teach. So what we do is we try and help other institutions create their own astronomy research seminar. So we teach them all the tools and usually we'll have instructors take our research seminar either with students or, or just on their own and they go through the whole process as if they're a student and end up with a publication um, and then they can start their own and I'll give, I'll you know, provide support over a couple of years to, until they're comfortable running their own research seminar. So um, it's kind of exciting to see that students are really contributing to this small field. And I, I like this field because while it's, sort of simple astronomy, it's, it's real astronomy, and it's something manageable within a semester or shorter. Um, and I love this, uh, the contribution from the students to, to the real data in, within this publication. They also publish elsewhere, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but these are the number of, the graph on the left, the number of seminar articles in the Journal of Double Star Observations per year. And it started out slow down there, a couple per year for a couple of years. And then um, I joined the team around middle of 2000, end of 2014. Um, we tried some stuff. And then by 2016, we were like, oh my gosh, 30 something publications from students. It went crazy. We have this online component 
um, and uh, it's exciting. And 2019, uh, this number is going to probably double in our in the next publication that comes out. So, uh, and then the graph on the left on the right shows the percentage of Journal of Double Star Observation articles contributed by the seminar. So notice that students are now contributing a third, more than a third of of these papers and that, that these measurements of positions and and um, angles uh, and uh, separations and position angles of double stars. And it's really fun. Um, the other thing that's going on is students are going beyond what we initially expect them to do. And, and especially if you have students that know coding, can do Python coding, they're just doing these amazing things like developing new tools. This is now, um, this double stars query is an, a browser-based tool to help select double stars that you can access with whatever telescope you're, you're using. And that is so cool because before we were using a couple different tools and it didn't work on this system or that system. And now there's this really beautiful one that a student created. Uh, another thing, another student used Desmos, if you're familiar with this online graphing tool, um, to study the orbital parameters. There are seven orbital parameters that go into these double star orbits and they can all be manipulated um, in this program so that you can get a really great sort of visual sense of what goes into an orbit and how we figure out orbits based on perhaps a hundred years of measurements that may or may not be so accurate. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, so students publish in the JDSO, students publish in some other journals that are available. And I also now, um, we, we all know as educators, the value of of presenting your work and interacting with an authentic audience. So I go around the country and put on workshops where I bring in amateur astronomers, professional astronomers, teachers, students, everybody into these workshops where they can learn about this astronomy research. And students can, who have done the research already will present their research. And it's such an amazing experience for them. This is, these are my favorite pictures so far. I've done five or six of these over the last few years. This one was at, in New York in April. Um, at the Northeast Astro Imaging Conference. And this shows some students presenting their research. And I, here's the, one of the papers titled Investigation of 11 Charter Systems, et cetera. But the people in the audience, oh my gosh, you guys. The guy in the blue shirt is astronaut Don Pettit, who's in line to go either up to the moon or back up to the International Space Station, where he's gone three times. It's his favorite place in the universe to be. Um, <laughs> Uh, and these students, he's sitting there in the audience listening to these students. The other person here is um, uh, Arnie Hendon here was the uh, executive director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers for 20 something years, I believe. Um, and so these students are really interacting with the people that know this stuff, professionals, and then they get to hang out with them. And it really adds meaning and value to their work and, their, and changes their sense of sort of being part of a community in a really big way. So that's this is some of what I do. Um, we, here's more examples of students presenting at different places. Here's um, Mount Wilson Observatory. We had two different times this summer. We had student groups go up there and use these historic telescopes that were used to discover, um, you know, that the Andromeda Nebula is actually a galaxy outside our own galaxy, you know, and students are using that telescope to collect data and, and write papers on, and that's really exciting. And um, these are just more students presenting at different conferences that I hold around the country. And um, it's really fun for me. Uh, the Astronomy Research Seminar last year, 2018, these were, you know, we're, we're spreading from our original location in, in uh, San Luis Obispo, California, um, uh, to quite a few other locations. But now I'm teaching a course where it was going to be um, instructors and students, college, mostly college instructors, um, some high school, and then some students all around the country. And then um, Gerald mentioned the International Astronomical Union that has the Minor Planet Center. Last week, I was in Munich, Germany, um, for the first biennial International Astronomical Union Astro EDU conference, so Astro um, Education Conference. So the International Astronomical Union has now created this new body to talk about education and help, you know, improve astronomy education globally. So now I had to make a new map because there are people in Portugal and Italy that are also in, in my research seminar now. Um, and, be, and these are instructors that want to bring it to all of the teachers within actually their um, countries. So that's really exciting. I do research on 
the impacts of this kind of research on students, uh, looking at, you know, what are the benefits, how does it affect their trajectories in, in um, education and careers, you know, does it change their identity, their sort of self-identity as scientists. It's very exciting work. Um, I was I always think it was really funny that astronomy was sort of not even close to the most important thing that students got out of the astronomy research seminar. Um, even one quote from a student, because I interviewed them, was like, yeah, I learned how to write and work in teams and blah, blah, blah. I wasn't really in it for the astronomy, but that was fun too. <laughs> so, um, and here I put on um, global conferences. Uh, our next one is going to be going to be in Melbourne, Australia in December, where it's all about bringing together the network, telescope network um, folks with the educators and science education evaluators, just bringing sort of the whole community together to expand the programs and, and help bring this most amazing astronomy to everyone we can. And this is one of my favorite pictures from the conference because on the left is Wayne Rosing, the founder of Las Cumbres Observatory Telescopes. Um, so there, that's the biggest network of, of truly sort of global network of telescopes. Um, and they do a lot of, they do actually both LCO and um, Skynet networks do gravitational wave follow-up observations. So these are what the professionals are using. They're doing cutting edge research. And so this is Wayne Rosing of Las Cumbres Observatory meeting Dan Reichert of Skynet Telescope. Uh, network and it was kind of amazing because it's basically an emerging of the two major telescope networks so that was really fun um, and that's that's what I do and we're going to be doing asteroids really soon because asteroids are amazing and I work with a lot of amateur astronomers who uh, do asteroid research um, who have telescopes that can be dedicated for you know two or three months at a time especially for things like studying binary asteroids which need this sort of more constant observation so astronomy is amazing. Love to interact with everyone. And thanks for listening. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. I think the primary question that I saw coming through during your presentation was regarding the age range of the research group. Do you also do high school students or is it just uh, university? Oh, absolutely high school. In fact, that's, uh, yes, I love working with the high school students. That's almost, that's almost my, that is my preference because this is accessible to high school students and it really gives them a better taste of science. There's research that shows that one of the reasons students don't go into science is because the science that they get in school is not actually anything like science. <laughs> so they don't really have an understanding of science. So this is an opportunity to change that a little bit. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so let's take about, there are a number of questions that are here in the chat. Um, so let's take maybe 10, 15 minutes and just kind of go through them and, you both can kind of answer the questions that you feel most comfortable answer answering. Um, I think the first question that we had was regarding cost of telescopes. Can you give us kind of a sense of how much these telescopes, I'm thinking more ground-based, how much the ground-based telescopes typically cost? Well, I can maybe help out a little bit there. Um, your typical amateur telescope, uh, fairly good quality, can cost you anywhere from five hundred to five thousand um, dollars. But you want to get not just a good telescope; you also want to get a really good mount. Uh, and mounts can cost as much as the telescope. Uh, I was working with a guy the other day uh, who has a very high-end telescope. It's an amateur telescope and a mount and and all the associated software and everything. And he's easily into it for $20,000. Now, most amateurs don't go quite that extreme, but it's not unusual to spend several thousand dollars on a telescope and a mount so that you can do astrophotography and you can uh, get some data that, that's useful. So, of course, then you can get into the much higher end stuff um, where it costs you know, upwards of $100,000. But uh, for an amateur, you can get in probably for two or $3,000 pretty easily. Great. Uh, so the next question is regarding PHAs. Um, and the question is kind of around predicted timelines. Mm -hmm. So what they're, what they're asking is, what's the predicted time when a million large potentially hazardous asteroids will be discovered? I think that's more related to uh, the rate. Like at what rate are we discovering those? 
Well, we discover probably close to 2,000 new asteroids a year. Now, they're not all near-Earth asteroids. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea of the, the numbers that we're talking about, we get um, buzzed, if you will, by asteroids several times a month. Uh, so far this year, since January 1st, there have been 42 asteroids that have come closer to the Earth than the Moon. Out of those 42, only two of them were considered PHAs. The vast majority of asteroids out there are small. They're too small to be a, a serious threat. Uh, anything smaller than 30 meters is probably going to burn up in our atmosphere. And the vast majority of near-Earth asteroids are in the 30 meter or less class. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of finding them, um, one of the requirements that NASA is working under is a requirement that they find all uh, asteroids larger than 140 meters. Uh, they were supposed to have it done by uh, 2020. I think the, the goal was 90% by 20, the year 2020. We are nowhere near reaching that goal. Uh, they also had a goal of finding 90% or more of asteroids larger than one kilometer. Those are the extinction level events. And we've actually achieved that goal. So we know we've now found more than 90% of the one kilometer or larger asteroids, but we've got a long way to go before we find the uh, 140 meter or larger asteroids. And again, most of the ones we find are much smaller, less than 50 meters. Yeah, uh, let me ask a quick follow up related to that, um, not in the chat, but I know there's probably out there with these questions. Mm. How do you know that you've found? 90% of those? Well, it takes a little bit of mathematics. Um, there's a kind of a long example that I hear once in a while. If you have a bucket full of beads and some of them are red and some of them are green and you randomly just reach in the bucket without looking and start pulling out beads and marking them and then putting them back in, eventually you start pulling out beads that are already marked. And so you know you've starting to see uh, roughly what the percentage of the total amount of beads is uh, for a given color. Uh, and the same thing is true for asteroids. When we start finding the same asteroid over and over again in the same size range, that sort of gives us a hint at what the percentage is of the total population for a given size of asteroid. So yeah, it's, it's some mathematics and some statistics involved, but it does work pretty well. And it does, you know, as we do actual observations, we're finding that it's, it's pretty accurate. That, that was a beautiful analogy. I loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Um, so the next question is regard, regarding research. So does your team's research involve any sort of artificial intelligence? And if so, where in the research and what is its purpose? Um, I assume that, that my student research programs, we don't use artificial intelligence. We just use regular intelligence. <laughs> and Gerald, do we use any artificial intelligence? Uh, the, in minor, the Minor Planet Center is using a little bit of it. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, which is going to come online in, a, I think they're going to actually start doing real science around the year 2023. And they will be using artificial intelligence. They're going to find so many transient objects out there that they have to have a way of sorting through them and picking the real objects from, you know, the hot pixels and the cosmic ray strikes and so forth. Uh, so they're going to be using artificial intelligence to do that. Great. Um, so the next question is, what other factors besides gravitational fields are considered when predicting the course of an asteroid? Well, I can answer that. Uh, there are a couple of factors. Uh, gravity is, the, of course, the dominant factor for determining orbits. But asteroids are subject to some other forces, uh, most notably something called the Yarkovsky effect. All asteroids rotate, some rotate fast, some slow. As they are rotating and orbiting around the sun, the side of the asteroid that faces the sun is heated by the sun. As the asteroid rotates, that heated side turns away from the sun and it then starts to radiate heat back out into space. That heat radiation actually creates a very small but measurable force on the asteroid that slowly changes its orbit. 
So you'll hear, when you study asteroid orbits, you'll hear a lot about the Yarkovsky effect. Uh, also, smaller asteroids can be affected by uh, the solar wind. And of course, then there's the occasional collision that changes everything. So there are a number of other uh, uh, factors, but primarily it's the gravitational pull of the sun and the planets. They all kind of work together. Great. And I want you to know that uh, most of these questions are coming from Tenafly High School. So, that, and they're asking fantastic questions. Yeah. I'll keep asking questions because we still have uh, about another seven, eight minutes that we can talk. Um, all right, so our next question is, what are some of the latest ways to use telescopes to solve the problem of identifying asteroid compositions? <laughs> Tough well, one. I'm, I'm, I'm giving Rachel a chance. To... Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> well, uh, so, I mean, I guess that would be um, spectroscopy, right, in large part. Right. Right. right? And we're, um, you know, there's a lot more and more spectrographs coming online on these telescopes, but that allows you to determine in large part the elements. So, are we using are we using ground-based telescopes for those or are those mostly yes. things? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Both, yeah. both ground-based and space-based uh, telescopes. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do good science on asteroids. You know, I focus on tracking the asteroids and finding their positions and how bright they are and so forth. But there are other uh, amateurs who work on things like uh, asteroid rotation rates, uh, uh, getting light curves on asteroids to see how fast they rotate. There are uh, astronomers who work just on spectroscopy of asteroids to try to determine their composition. So there's a lot of different things you can do in, in terms of asteroid research. You don't just need to be tracking them. Okay. Um, so I'm going to actually combine, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, I was just going to add one little thing to that, which is sort of the, the sort of new field of wide binary asteroids. Um, these are much harder to detect, but they're very cool because they're giving us insight into the behavior. And you mentioned the, Gerald mentioned the Yarkovsky effect, and, and that has, has a role in this where as these asteroids, they can, they can get spun up by these effects and then break apart, but then they're still gravitationally bound. And so they'll come, depending on the masses of the two pieces, then they'll come back together and, and form a contact binary. And in fact, I think the one that we landed on recently um, was that contact binary. And we learned a lot from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that can, we can also learn about the, the composition of these asteroids because you have to sort of know how, what is it that's allowing them to sort of stick back together and, and all that. Um, but these wide binary asteroids are something that to take, they're really hard to, to observe or to find. So it, it was, I think, almost fortuitous that people were doing these long observations and sort of saw a secondary period in addition to the, the rotational period of an asteroid. And then we're like, oh, there's something else here. Anyway, so there's lots of cool science in there. Absolutely. And, and even to follow on with the binary, um, if the people on the line don't know, when we got to Banu, you know, the plan, the plan was to do this sample return where you just kind of take this canister and you just kind of touch the surface and it would collect up what we thought was going to be dust. And as a matter of fact, when we get there, it's just kind of like a big ball of just rubble just kind of stuck together and it just kind of poofs out and then goes back and it's, it's weird. Yeah, it turns out that a lot of the asteroids are what we call rubble pile asteroids. They're just collections of rocks and gravel that are just loosely bound gravitationally and by static electrical forces and easily broken apart and not so easily sampled. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other side, those are also things that should they enter Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, they break up, break up real easily. Right. right, so a little less, a little less of the scary type of asteroid. <laughs> um, so yeah. related to scary asteroids, I'm going to kind of combine a few questions together around that. Um, so there's uh, questions about the what are the next steps. So when you identify these PHAs, these things that are on a on a collision course with Earth, um, you know what are the next steps you know what do we what do we do as a nation what do we do as as the globe the world to try to um you know do we build anti-asteroid 
weapons? You know, what do we do? What's the plan? Well, there are actually a, a number of proposals, some of which have been tested and some of which are going to be tested uh, real soon. Um, one concept is called the impactor concept, where you go up to an asteroid, take a spacecraft up to an asteroid, and you basically fire a bullet at it. Uh, but it's a large uh, mass, and it hits the asteroid, and it bumps the asteroid, changing its orbit. Uh, another concept is the gravity tractor, where you take a massive spacecraft, uh, put it in orbit directly in front of the asteroid. The mutual gravitation between the spacecraft and the asteroid allows the spacecraft to change course very gradually and pull the asteroid along with it. Um, so there's ideas like that. You can uh, one kind of uh, weird uh, suggestion is to paint the asteroid white. If you paint it white, it changes its reflectivity and that means the, that Yarkovsky effect changes and that can uh, deflect the asteroid. But any of these concepts has to be done not a week before impact, it's gotta be done years before impact. Because if you do it years before impact, it takes a very small change in the orbit to cause the asteroid to miss the Earth. If you wait until a week or so, a month, even a month before impact and try to do this, you're just not going to be able to deflect it enough to avoid impact. But the really important point is impacts are extremely rare. They don't happen very often, especially impacts by large asteroids. So, uh, you know, we've got we got Mother Nature working on our side, making sure that for the most part, we're, we're really not in that much danger from them. Okay, and we're gonna end with this one last question, which is looking into the future. So how do you see the field of asteroid hunting and imaging changing and evolving in the future? Um, LSST is gonna change it a lot. Uh, LSST is uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope it's going to be able to spot a million transits per night. So it's gonna be a huge amount of data. And, and like I said before, they're gonna use artificial intelligence to sort through that and get the real stuff from the, uh, the not so real stuff. But still, it's gonna be a tremendous amount of data and we're gonna to have to be able to uh, process, that, uh, process that data, follow up on all those observations. So it's gonna be a major game changer. Awesome, thank you so much. And with just a few minutes left, I think it's time to make our big announcement here over at Infiniscope. So uh, for those of you that haven't been around since the beginning or you're new to Infiniscope and you haven't heard, um, our very first learning experience that we designed here is actually called Where Are the Small Worlds? And it's an asteroid hunting game. Um, and so what you do is you actually uh, use, you kind of use Kepler's third law, you kind of just don't know you're using it, um, in order to identify where these are in the solar system. So you, based on the speed of the object, you determine whether or not it's a near Earth object, whether it's a main asteroid belt object, or if it's a Kuiper belt object. And honestly, the Kuiper belt objects are very, very difficult to find because they move so terribly slow in the night sky. So our big announcement, let me uh, do a quick screen share here, is that officially, as of last Thursday, we have released a new updated version of this game called Women in STEM. So when you play this game, um, just, like the, just like our original game, you actually start out with an introduction from Lindy Elkins Stanton, who is the principal investigator of the Psyche mission, and she is based here out of ASU. I actually am gonna hit the end here so I can show you a couple of other things. If you have played this game before, what you'll notice is that we've actually updated the stars, the night sky. So it's a little harder and easier to see the objects, which is a really weird thing. So you can you may or may not be able to discern it on your screen because we are in fact sharing via zoom and it doesn't do a great job of showing but these objects are moving on our screen and i'm going to go ahead and accept our mission and we start to explore for these small worlds that uh, has been explored by a woman in stem you get to meet her 
you get to learn a little bit about her past, uh, what she's done with that particular, with a particular mission to explore that world. Um, and you'll also earn a gold coin instead of a silver coin for uh, finding her world. So I will leave you with the big challenge of head out and start playing with the women in STEM version of Where are the Small Worlds and see if you can find all of the gold coins that are hidden out on those 15 worlds uh, we've hidden there. So with that, I want to say personally, thank you all for coming to this webinar. We do have it recorded. Uh, Vivian has done a fantastic job of making sure that she'll be sending that information over. Um, I will send a follow-up email to everyone uh, with all of the resources and make sure you have access to anything and everything that you've been asking for. And also one final thank you to Gerald and Rachel. Thank you for taking your time and sharing your world with us uh, so that we can better educate the people that we work with. My pleasure. Okay. And thank you. All right. Thank you all and we will be in touch.